most important question because I don't know this about you. How did you get into soul music? Oh, I was a um, I was a, a, a not wanted, uh, just underage mod, and my brother was a mod, and he he used to have a post office van that uh, every every weekend he would go out with all his mates, and they would go to places in Nottingham and. Uh, go go and see people like Stevie Wonder at the Clyde Drum in, in Boston, and I always wanted to be part of it, you know. And uh, I wasn't allowed to be because I was 14, and so I liked soul music because they all liked soul music. Everybody in them was those days. If you had a scooter, yeah. If you was a mod, it was soul music. Uh, school in those days was, was in, in, in split into two, or well, split into three really. That you, you had soul people. Okay. And then you had people who were into progressive rock. Okay, they so were called, like basically they, the mods and the rock. We used there. to call them hairies because they had longer <laughs> hair, and mods had nice, n- n- nicely cut hair. Yeah. And then you had people who weren't into anything really. So it was like three different things. And uh, the soul thing really got me very early on. You know, I can remember my uh, my, my mate uh, Danny Reynolds being devastated that Otis Redding had died in '68. Oh my or was it 67? Yeah. 68. I was still at school anyway. And uh, and people were mourning the death of Otis Redding, but that's when I was aware of soul music, really. I mean, I can remember Otis Redding on Top of the Pops with Carla Thomas singing Tramp. And Otis Redding was in, a, in one of those uh, farm jean things with the things over the top. You know, with bibs like, at the front. So, that just yeah. sounds heavenly, so, really. I mean, like. So soul music was a thing, um, uh, really was into Motown, uh, the local youth club used to play Motown, we had a, a DJ who was hipper than what we knew he was, he would play things like the right track Billy Butler in 69 and stuff like that, uh, and we just thought it was great music, he used to play Driving Beat, Willie Mitchell, which we thought was good, and Homer Banks, 60 Minutes of Your Love, and a lot of love, and then one day, I was out with the lads, uh, my brother's friends, I was sort of like, I don't know, I was accepted that night and we ended up back at uh, uh, his friend's house, uh, a guy who uh, who was a respected mod, I would say. And we went to his house and I'll never forget, he'd just got married and, uh, and there were some records piled up in the corner. In those days you'd never put sleeves on records. How come? I don't know. They would just throw away things and you just had them in the corner and they would pile up. Yeah, uh, I guess and so. they used to be put like on a dance set, it. so yeah. you put eight at a time and they would drop down. So condition was was not even there. And I found this one record by um, Homer Banks called Hook by Love. And I had no, I, I'd never heard it before and I put it on and it just blew me away. And that's the first record I, I, I bought for any amount of money. It was two and six. How, how, how much was the record? Two and six. Two and six. Oh. So, I mean, it makes a difference to the kind of records that you buy nowadays as well, then? Yeah, it was two or six, and it was the, the start of my record collection. Um, and the, the guy who sold me it went on to be a T-Rex freak, you know? So, <laughs> so he went from being top mod into being a T-Rex freak, uh, which was... And I had his... Uh, I got his home banks. But I went, went back uh, um, a few times afterwards, and I, I remember getting Jackie Wilson's on Coral got whispers and things like that. So this guy was quite hip for the time because, you know, Homer Banks never sold a bean in, in England. Do you still have some of these records, the first no, records No, no. Like my life got uh, got really worse when I went to college. I had, like, a, a pretty good collection. I had a few cameo partways. I had, uh, I'm trying to think what I had, a few Motown imports and things. And then a friend of mine introduced me to a guy called uh, Brian 45 Phillips. Not him personally, but he was the first mail order guy, and he's no, called I himself. I'm, I'm Bro- pretty sure I've he heard di- that name. He, no, he DJs now. He's still a, he was a, a Twisted Wheel DJ, but he I did a mail order thing in the very early seventies, um, uh, selling records. But he would have all imports. We'd never heard of any of them. I'd never heard of any of these records, you know. Yeah. And I found that fascinating. So anyway, um, somebody said to me, Jim Soul Clark, Clark, Sweet Darling. And this is what I'm talking. I was at college, it would have been 1970, 71. Jimmy Soul Clark was on his, uh, on his uh, mail order list for about four pound, mm-hmm. uh, which was a lot of money for one single record, a lot of money. And I didn't have four pound. So I took my record collection, 
into the local thing right next to the college, I'll never forget. I took them all in and I sold 200 records for £5. And it was all, you know, my Homer Banks on Liberty was yeah, in there, yeah. some cameo part Just for this one record? Just for this one record, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. And Do you regret I got absolutely it? ripped off to. Uh, no, I don't regret it because it then took me on to another level of collecting right. because Jimmy Soul Clark to have that was was really hip in those days. And I can remember a guy on uh, Leicester Market, he, uh, I saw him sell um, Derby Gray out on the floor for four pounds, which I thought, oh God, I'm an IT, you know. That was the, so this was the, the this start was the beginning of, of yeah. a long life of records yeah, yeah. collecting I and I used to spend my wages obsession. with him. Every Thursday he would be on the market and there'd be a queue around his store and I'd spend my wages every Thursday. <laughs> yeah. That is not a big story, there's a lot of people yeah. that have done that, I'm pretty sure you're not the only one.